Good evening, everybody. Hello. Well, my name is Kyle Phillips, and I'm here to talk to you tonight from the Secretary of State's office. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, graduated from Iowa State in 89. Started as a developer in the Secretary of State's office 2001. IT lead in 2008, IT director in 2018. But uh, those things are kind of cool. But the main thing is I've been in information security role no matter what I've been doing in the office. Um, a little bit about the Secretary of State's office. Everybody knows Secretary of State does elections. Um, that's actually the smaller part of our office. The bigger part of our office is the, the sort of business services side of things. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but Secretary of State, uh, when it was created in our state back in the 1800s, was literally secretary or record keeper of data. So secretary of state data. And so we still do that, um, keeping a lot of data, um, primarily business data, um, lien data, notary data, if you're going to start a business, if you're going to file a business filing, that's done in the Secretary of State's office. Um, and that's really sort of the, the major thing of what we do. Um, but of course we also do elections. Um, probably most of you know elections are actually administered at the county, not in our office. So Secretary of State, we don't manage election equipment or voting machines, we don't manage polling places or poll workers. We don't handle ballots, we don't really handle voter registration data. All that's handled in the county auditor's office. What we do do is we administer election law. Um, we manage the statewide voter registration system. Uh, that's a .NET application running in a Citrix environment, and the counties are the users of those systems. Um, believe it or not, there actually are cybersecurity rules, almost like a compliance that county auditor's offices are required by law to track, and so we are sort of the compliance officer of um, navigating the, with those counties to see where they, um, wh what compliance they meet, what compliance they don't meet, and helping them to get to compliance. Um, if you're going to be a candidate for office in Iowa, that's something we do in our office, and then uh, reporting unofficial results on election night is something we do in our office. Um, all of the applications that you see on our site or running in our office are all custom applications built either by Secretary of State IT staff or contract vendors or contract employees. Um, so any of those types of things um, are custom applications and that's going to become more important uh, later on in my presentation. Uh, but what I'm really here to talk about tonight is our vulnerability disclosure program. We launched our VDP back in September of 2020. Um, we were um, actually the first state office in Iowa, uh, actually the first of any government office in Iowa to have a VDP, and to my knowledge, still the only one to have um, like an actual coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Second um, VDP for a Secretary of State office in the nation, Ohio beat us by a month. Uh, you're probably all aware of Bug Crowd and Hacker One, sort of being the big players in the coordinated uh, vulnerability disclosure space. We're associated with Bug Crowd. Uh, no, I am on slide seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let me restart. How's that look? Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yep, that's okay. All right. 
So continuing on, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, VDP, sort of do's and don'ts, what the scope of our program is. And you can see this for yourself if you go to our website, uh, scroll down a little bit, and on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a, like a blue, big blue button there that says vulnerability disclosure policy. But I'll go over a little bit of this right now. Um, as far as the scope of our, um, our, our program is, basically any domain ending sos.io.gov, most notably, that's you know our actual site, sos.io.gov, and then our business filing um, web um, server, which is filings.sos.io.gov. Uh, you can see the full list of all the, um, there are some other ones that are like some WordPress sites and things um, that don't actually end in sos.io.gov, but are in scope of our program. Um, our expectations for uh, people who are participating in our program, obviously, uh, not to cause a denial of service with our systems, to not engage in physical pen testing, social engineering, obviously not defacing anything. And then our policy asks that um, any vulnerabilities found uh, be kept private, be kept confidential for 90 days. Um, as a security researcher, you're welcome to use any tool in your toolbox to do any kind of hunting, vulnerability scanning, um, web application pen testing, uh, port scanning, whatever Whatever you want to do, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's there uh, for you to do. Uh, for security researchers who do find a vulnerability, we ask that you um, provide us a detailed description of the location and impact um, of the vulnerability you found. Step-by-step -step instructions are great. Uh, if you can provide any sort of video, proof of concept video or screenshots um, and any technical information that would be related are all helpful in um, helping us to uh, verify that it is a vulnerability um, so that we know the steps to reproduce it. You can report things to us by actually being a bug crowd um, researcher, um, but also on that um, page that I alluded to earlier that has our policy on it, there's a, there's a form there too that you can just fill out uh, without being actually associated with bug crowd. So a few stats about our program since we launched um, back in September of 2020, we've had 219 submissions 24 of those have been confirmed to be vulnerabilities that we have found or fixed. And of those 24, we've had two that have been high or severe, nine moderate, and 13 lows. You may be wondering why the big discrepancy between 219 submissions but only actual 24 vulnerabilities. Uh, a big reason for that, uh, I mentioned earlier, the scope of our program. Um, probably a third of those submissions are out of scope. So they may be vulnerabilities on somebody's website, but it's not within scope of our program, and so those, those are not accepted. Bug Crowd vets all of these before they pass them on to us, so we actually never see the ones that are out of scope. Um, some other reasons that things aren't accepted is it might be you know two, two or three security researchers find uh, the same vulnerabilities, and so only the first one is actually accepted. Uh, sometimes the steps to reproduce uh, we can't, or, the, or at least bug crowd, or we can't reproduce them, so for those reasons, uh, we don't accept that as a vulnerability. Most of the researchers, like 90% probably, are outside the U.S. Uh, in fact, a great deal of them are actually from India, and that's fine. Um, we don't really care where a security researcher is from, but it would be really cool if the security researcher was from Iowa. So Iowa security researchers helping secure the Secretary of State's office in Iowa elections. And that is what I'm here to invite you to do tonight. Uh, I want to make sure you all know about this program, invite you to you know, take a look at our program, e either individually or collectively. Um, you know, I, I, my chief of staff uh, was uh, looking, was on a hunt, I think it was maybe this past December for a uh, security researcher who was from Iowa, and we, we couldn't find one. There wasn't one that, that, that existed. So uh, he was wanting to do all kinds of social media and, you know, picture, picture on Facebook. So uh, that's a possibility, by the way, if you, if you uh, are able to participate and find a vulnerability uh, within our, within our um, scope. The rest of this, uh, I guess, maybe 10 more minutes or so of my talk, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the vulnerabilities that have been discovered by other security researchers to kind of give you an idea maybe where your skill level um, might uh, be able to contribute. This first slide is um, kind of an overview of, uh, of the 219 submissions uh, and sort of how those are categorized with cross-site scripting being sort of the major one that, that, uh, that people have found. 
So I have four examples to share with you tonight. Uh, this one here is actually the most recent. Security researcher found, I don't know how well you can see that, but the security researcher found on one of the sites that is within scope, elections101.iowa.gov, found a bash script that was um, publicly exposed, uh, which the script itself couldn't be executed, but did reveal some sensitive information, like passwords, for example. Uh, so that one was one that was uh, pretty easy for us to clean up, just deleting a file. Another example, uh, I mentioned our business filing system earlier. And to use our business filing system, you have to have an account as a user. And so since we have supporting accounts, we have to have a way for people to reset their password. The security researcher noticed that we didn't have any rate limiting on the password reset screen. So in theory, an attacker could spam that, um, that button to reset the password and email bomb uh, a legitimate user of fast track filing in our filing system. So uh, that was one that we were able to clean up. Uh, one of the um, one of the first ones we got in was kind of a, a, a kind of a funny one and not too serious of a vulnerability, but uh, our developers uh, didn't sanitize input boxes for when you signed up for an account. And you could actually put HTML within an input box. And so uh, he demonstrated this by putting uh, a picture, a link to a picture in for the first name and then sent himself a password reset. And it says hi, and then there's a picture, and then there, here's, there's his last name. This one, uh, so on the earlier slide, you saw that there were two severe high vulnerabilities. And so this is one of those. This is probably the most serious vulnerability that has been uh, discovered so far. Um, Bug Crowd reveres or considers a, a high vulnerability to be one where it could, it, it could be a, an account compromise or the leaking of sensitive information. So I don't know how well that link is showing up there on the screen, but um, if you were to go to our website, our business filing website again, and again go to that uh, password reset page, request a password reset for your account, this link here is what you would get back in your email, and that's the link you would click on to reset your password. So let's take a closer look at this. So you can see in the query string, we've got uh, the first parameter is UID equals and then some random um, numbers. Um, UID, anybody have a guess what that might be? User ID, good, good guess. <laughs> um, anybody have any guesses as to what that random bunch of numbers might be? Base 64 encoded, and you can see the actual output is an integer. So what this means is that if you were to take another number, say 100,728, and you were to base 64 encode it, replace this, use the same link, but just replace the UID with, with the new encoded string, you could reset somebody else's password. So in theory, you could actually reset every password of every user in our system and even potentially take it a step further and then just start spamming email addresses. So this, this um, vulnerability didn't reveal the email address, um, so it's more of an annoying thing, but he could have reset a bunch of passwords and then tried to f find an email address that matches an account and, and be able to do an account compromise in that way. So this is one we fixed, uh, I think, in pretty quick. So a couple more slides left. Um, what has worked well? Um, well, our office has always been really you know, focused on information security, um, not only for elections, but for our business filing systems. So we have routinely have done vulnerability scans, pen testing, uses, usage of web application firewalls. So we had high confidence um, in our security uh, for a long time. But VDP allows us to you know, have even higher confidence, 24 things fixed that we may not have otherwise uh, discovered. Um, granted, some of them, you know, a picture and a first name maybe isn't uh, too, high, too big of a concern, but um, it just gives us a higher level of confidence. One of the things sometimes people worry about when doing vulnerability disclosure is that it's going to overwhelm your development staff with a whole bunch of things to fix. And we were worried about that too. Uh, but um, 
we, we took the dive and, it, and we, it, there wasn't, it, that never happened. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, sort of how things have kind of been up and down with the program in terms of participation uh, on the next slide. Uh, another thing that's worked well for us is um, the VDP has allowed us to be more involved in the info InfoSec community. So being here tonight is an example of that. Um, our office is um, working also with DMAC and Iowa State in terms of working with their cybersecurity students and trying to um, work with them and get them interested in election security and, and, and in programs like this one. What has not worked well? Uh, I mentioned earlier there's uh, a bunch of uh, submissions to our program have been out of scope. That kind of surprised us. I think uh, maybe as many as a third of, uh, of, this, of the submissions to our uh, VDP have been out of scope. Uh, that's not necessarily a problem for us, but it can be a problem for other Iowa.gov domains who are now being like hit with um, vulnerability um, scans and uh, pen testing that they didn't ask for or invite. Um, so there has been some issues. I know and even in Ohio, uh, they had some issues with security researchers Try, attempting to participate in their VDP, but, but doing sites that were out of scope and causing denial of service problems uh, for those sites. Uh, we haven't seen that in Iowa. Uh, sustaining momentum in the reporting. So our program, when we started, it was a, what we, was considered a private program. So the only security researchers who could participate were those who as, were associated with Bug Crowd and were invited to participate. Um, Again, we had the 24 vulnerabilities that were found. I think nine of those were found in the first week or two of the program. Um, about six months into the program, we invited another set of security researchers in. We got another bump of um, reports coming in, and it kind of flattened out. September of 2021, we took our program from a private program to a public program. What that means is that any bug crowd researcher, and they claim to have 100,000 security researchers um, in their system. Um, so any, anybody could participate in our program once we took it public in September of 2021. We got a little bump then. Uh, but since September of 2021, we've only had one report, one vulnerability report, and that's the one I showed earlier about the, the shell, the bash script that was um, publicly exposed. Uh, so um, we're, we're gonna try to do a better effort of making our VDP known uh, with groups like this so we can sort of keep maybe a more uh, level uh, sustaining momentum of, of reports coming in. Another thing that has not worked so well is uh, my security staff um, has more work to do now because they see more uh, when they're doing threat hunting or when they're reviewing, um, they're doing their weekly reviews of security reports, they're seeing a lot more stuff. So it's taking them a little bit more time because they don't know, I mean, we, when we look at um, threat hunting results. We don't know if that's a security researcher or actual threat actor. We have to, of course, assume it's a threat actor, and that just takes us a little bit more time, but um, we, think it, we do think it is time well spent. So that's um, all I have to um, talk about tonight. Here's my contact information for LinkedIn and GitHub. Uh, feel free to connect with me on either platform. Um, again, I hope that uh, uh, some of you um, would be interested uh, in participating in the program collectively or individually, however you choose. And um, yeah. are there any questions? Yes? I haven't done it myself. So the question was how easy it is, how easy is it to get set up on Bug Crowd? Uh, I, I've heard, it's, I haven't done it myself, but I've heard it's pretty easy. Um, you don't have to provide them um, a lot of information. Um, and uh, you also don't have to participate with Bug Crowd to participate in this program uh, if you don't want to. Um, I will mention one thing, um, talking about momentum, I meant to, meant to mention this earlier. Um, I am lobbying to transition our program from a VDP to an actual bug bounty program where we'll actually pay out money for vulnerabilities to be found. Uh, I don't know if that's gonna happen, um, but I am certainly um, I'm pushing uh, for that to happen so that we can sort of continue to have that um, increased um, interest. Yes? Well, 
what would it take to get to? To get to, a, to, to bring the program into a low-value program. So I, I don't think it's going to, uh, you know, you hear about a bug bounty program and, you know, these tens of thousands or these big bounties being paid out. Um, but I, I think it's, it's going to take money is what it's going to take. And so um, Secretary of State has uh, primarily three sources of funding. The, the main one is an appropriation from the legislature. And uh, money for a bug bounty is not going to come from that because it's pretty thin. Um, two other sources of uh, funding for our office are uh, federal grants and federal grants for elections and specifically. So I think that might be where the money can come from. So the biggest roadblock right now is just finding the money to be able to support a bug bounty. Um, one of the things I'm lobbying for is to say, you know, look, even we don't, we don't have to commit to having a bug bounty program forever. We can just say here's, you know, $10,000 or $50,000 and we'll have a bug bounty program until that funding is gone. So that seems to be um, well accepted um, by the secretary, and uh, so I'm hopeful that um, that we can that we'll be able to to take that approach at minimum. Yeah. It, um, I think it's causing alert fatigue <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, the, the, the question was uh, how is the increased alerting and increased uh, threat hunting results affecting the security team? And, I, and I, it is causing, um, so I think, so the reason I say that I think it's causing alert fatigue is because uh, there's one in particular that we get all the time. and. Um, and for the first, I don't know, seven or eight or ten times we saw it, we are like, what is this, what is this, what is this? And we even contacted Bug Crowd and said, are these IP addresses, do you know if these, this is your people? And um, they said, we don't have any record of that, so we don't know that it is. Um, we are finally able to sort of dig into some log files and see that um, it was the, the work that the, 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 what the data that we saw was strongly indicative that it was somebody most likely participating in the bug crowd program. It was the same scan every time. It appeared to be on a schedule. Uh, so um, we don't look at that one anymore. Uh, we still get the alerts, but, but that's, that's one of the reasons I say alert fatigue. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, I wasn't involved in that process back in 2018, but uh, I know we looked at um, Bug Crowd, Hacker One, and Synapse are the three that we um, got, you know, we're in contact with. Um, and I think it basically came down to price with Bug Crowd being a better price. And we've, and we've been real happy with, with the platform. Yeah. I'm not aware. Um, I, it's, there's a big push in the election community. Um, so there, I've, I've heard that, that um, in the next year, two years, there'll be 23 Secretary of State's offices that will be doing a VDP. Um, there's two right now, still just the two. <laughs> um, CISA, uh, they're also um, contracted with Bug Crowd for vulnerability disclosure. Actually, theirs is a full bug bounty program for federal sites. Um, California, the state of California, also I think associated with Bug Crowd, is also um, uh, has a VDP for all of their state offices. No, <laughs> we're not. We're, we, so we've been in there as an attendee, but we've not been invited to participate. And um, I think the election community at large. Um, wants to participate, um, very much wants to participate. Um, I think the pandemic has kind of slowed things down in terms of what, what um, has happened the last two years at least, I know. Uh, I know that uh, 
people from Iowa were there at DEF CON in 2019. Um, uh, I don't think anyone's going this year, um, but uh, I think that's something that, um, in my, this is just my personal opinion, not the opinion of the office, that um, really needs to be a cooperative effort between security researchers as well as election officials. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Just knowing what, uh, you know, for example, Arizona and Colorado, what's, what's been happening out there uh, in terms of, you know, machines being decertified uh, in some cases because of um, security research. That's not to say that security research couldn't be done, but it'd have to be, you know, coordinated with uh, the, the, the right people. I don't know if you guys uh, are aware of this, but uh, before, two things actually. Number one, did y'all know that there's an election in Iowa almost every Tuesday of the year? It's not just like next week and then again in November. There's actually an election in Iowa almost every Tuesday. It may be one county, special election in one county. It may be, you know, um, a um, school board election somewhere or a city election somewhere. There may be only uh, a few counties or it may be all across Iowa. Um, so that's number one. Number two is before any election in any uh, county in Iowa, um, all the equipment is pulled out of um, secure storage for a test. And so ballots are ran through the machines. Uh, it's already known in advance what, how the count should come out. Ballots are ran through. The results that are tabbed by the tabulators are compared to the results that were already you know, known before that. And that's a public test. And you all can go to that public test. And every county does it. Yeah. So um, the question was about, as a citizen of Iowa, participating in um, obser observation and, and review of the election process. And um, I'm, I'm not the most qualified to answer that, uh, per that question, uh, Brandon, but I'd be happy to put you in touch with the person who could answer that better, maybe by email, if that would be OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is on YouTube, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you again for uh, being, let, letting me come and speak to you tonight. Thank you.